Thank you. So you'll uh, you notice there's quite an overlap between my topic and, and Ed Hoover's topic. Um, and Ed really gave you the pathogenesis and how this agent works in animals. And I think our talks will be fairly complimentary. I'm going to take a somewhat different approach and try to look at some of the ecology and um, what's going on in terms of uh, some of the field aspects of, of this disease. So um, as, as Ed sort of explained, we have uh, CWD that uh, deer get infected by either ingestion or um, uh, potentially uptake through the uh, na uh, nasal area as well. Um, and the, exactly how um, the agent uh, goes through the body is perhaps probably a bit of a conundrum at this point. I think Ed sort of talked about that in terms of going through the nervous system and or through the blood uh, as well. But basically the lymph nodes seem to get infected pretty early in the process uh, after ingestion or after infection. That seems to then move to the, to the nervous tissue, the spinal cord, and eventually gets to the brain. But as we've developed more and more sensitive methods, I think we found that almost all the tissues in, in deer um, have some degree of positivity to them. Um, probably pretty much everything except bone and antlers kind of, kind of thing. Anything that has blood and, and our nervous tissue associated with it. Um, so in particular, uh, things we are concerned about are things like muscle that might be consumed by humans and some of those other uh, aspects as well. And so um, this sort of has led to the, the fact that we have an uh, agent that's being shed by these animals in their saliva, their feces, and blood, and urine, as sort of Ed uh, described quite well. So some of the patterns that we see um, in the work that's been published, we see differences between the deer species, between mule deer and white-tailed deer, um, in comparison to elk, for example, in terms of how they accumulate um, prions in their tissues. Elk seem to have a lower prevalence uh, of CWD than we find in deer. Um, elk seem to have a much longer uh, incubation period as well for the disease. It takes much longer for the disease to um, cause uh, uh, symptoms in them. Typically, it's a couple of years for the mule deer and the white-tailed deer, and for elk, it can easily go uh, another year or two beyond that as well. Um, particularly in the, in the deer species, the, the lymph nodes are, are, are infected fairly early in, in the uh, stage of the disease. And those are tissues that we typically use then for um, carcasses or for detecting uh, animals that are infected uh, in a post-mortem sense. Um, and elk seem to be a lot more variable in terms of how they react. The, the lymph nodes don't seem to be as fe infected as early um, as they are in some of the deer species. So what we sort of think um, happens with the different tissues and uh, different secretions that animals have in terms of their levels of infectiousness, is we think that saliva and blood are somewhere near the top of that list probably as being the most infectious tissues. I'm not sure if we figured out exactly where blood falls in that hierarchy quite yet compared to saliva. It may depend on things like species and other things. Feces seems to be a little bit below that. And urine seems to be sort of on the lower end of, of having infectivity. It's harder for us to detect um, prions in urine than it is in feces and some, of the, and some of the other tissues or secretions. So these are things, of course, we worry about in terms of transmitting the disease. Um, so the way that the disease is transmitted, typically there's um, a couple of different uh, mechanisms, uh, important mechanisms by which it's transmitted. The first one is probably direct contact between animals. So it can be passed by bodily fluids, particularly, I mean, deer are very social kind of creatures. So they contact each other, they groom each other. Um, so it can be easily passed by, by saliva, for example, when that's occurring. It can be passed um, by urine, um, particularly, um, as well, um, during the breeding season, potentially. And then I have blood on this list. It's, uh, well, we'll talk about that a little bit in a little while, about the potentials there. Second real route of transmission is through the environment. And so in the environment, we're particularly concerned about carcasses because carcasses that die from CWD are highly infectious and have a lot of infectious prions in them. But in addition, saliva, urine, and feces are all deposited in the environment in various places. And so those can lead to um, infection of other animals uh, through environmental or indirect routes. So we're not really sure where um, 
uh, prions or CWD might hang out in the environment and what the sources of that might be for infecting susceptible animals. But some of the things that we think might be important are areas that concentrate animals in particular. So things like mineral licks. Um, John Fisher showed a great picture of animals coming to mineral licks that, um, where they're concentrated and where they're drinking water and also consuming soil to get the, the nutrients from that. Feeding and baiting sites, um, which have the same sort of uh, effect in terms of gathering animals where they're going to drop saliva, defecate, and those kind of things. And that's why uh, most areas that have uh, CWD have, have banned baiting and feeding of, of animals for both recreational purposes and uh, observation. Other things like scrapes during the breeding season where urine and, and occasionally actually saliva is deposited on branches, but urine in the soil as a marker uh, might be other routes. And of course, some kind of food sources that might be somewhat less concentrated than feeding and baiting might be a potential source as well. Water is another potential source, particularly small, small bodies of water that might not be uh, diluted, um, dilute the prion agent. Soil ingestion, particularly at mineral licks um, or other areas, uh, most of the deer species ingest a fair amount of soil. And then plants. Plants are another potential route of, uh, of infection uh, through the environment. Unfortunately, I think we're really lacking on our understanding of how important each of those mechanisms of transmission of the disease are. And I'm going to talk a little bit about more about that. I think that's a really important question that we need to address, but it's a very difficult one as well. So how we know that animals are infected by both direct and indirect routes is because of some pen studies that were done um, by Mike Miller et al. Um, in Colorado. And what they found is that if animals were placed with infected deer, so there's potentially just uh, contact between animals, that two of 10 animals, susceptible animals in that pen became infected. If they put them in with infected carcasses, um, three of 12 became infected. And if they put them in with just where there's residual excreta, uh, urine and feces, and these are pretty highly contaminated pens um, where they've housed infected deer for quite a long time, but those deer became infected as well. So that's how we know what the, that both routes are important. Unfortunately, this is just in a pen study. So how well it replicates what happens in the, in the real deer, deer world is, is uh, subject to some uh, investigation still and some a large degree of uncertainty. So I tried to maybe put together what we know about when animals might be shedding amongst the several different species. So uh, things are appropriately color coded for urine, feces, and saliva. And one thing I would point out here is that um, these deer may be, and elk may be shedding before these time periods, but these are some of the earliest that we've documented. It doesn't mean that they don't shed before that. And most, as, as was described earlier, most of them are going to continue to shed all the way through their clinical phase as well as, as, as they reach death. So for white-tailed deer, um, we've documented that uh, urine can be infectious within three months, feces within six months, and saliva within three months. So early on, these animals are fairly consistently shedding uh, prions into the environment or potentially um, to other animals as well, other susceptible animals. For mule deer, the earliest documentation we have for urine is 18 months, feces six months, and we don't, I can't find anything we have on saliva um, in mule deer at this point. And elk, in contrast, um, seem to also have a, a, a we documented um, shedding in urine uh, at 18 months, but shedding in feces as early as one month. So I suspect that many of these animals are actually shedding earlier than we've documented them at this point in time. It's just that we haven't necessarily done the studies to actually look at it. And this is an area I think we need to, to think about a little more. So the, these animals are shedding infectious prions for both contact to other animals and into the environment for quite a long time. Uh, and quite soon, after, typically quite soon after they become infected with CWD. So I mentioned in, uh, that blood is infectious and uh, some of uh, Dr. Mathiasen's work has certainly showed that that uh, can be uh, certainly infectious. Um, and she mentioned transfusions. Well, deer don't get transfusions. Um, but deer, particularly males, when they lose their antlers, do have bloody pedestals. Uh, 
and it's been observed at least by um, one, one pretty good resource, that deer tend to occasionally lick those buddy pedestals, other males that are in conjunction with those animals. And so there's a potential route of blood exposure there that I'm not sure how frequent that is. I think we probably don't have a good idea of how frequent that is or how much of a risk factor it is, but it's certainly a potential way that um, animals could be infected by direct contact. So what do we know about, so there's also differences in relative susceptibility amongst the species as well. Deer seem to be more likely to be infected than elk. Um, they get higher prevalences. It's really pretty unclear how white-tailed deer and mule deer compare. They seem to be sort of uh, pretty similar, but it's possible that white-tailed deer may be a little more susceptible than mule deer, more likely to become infected. And one of the things is certain for all three species that the, the PRNP genotype um, of those animals makes a big difference in terms of not only how long it takes them to become infected or their ability to become infected, but how long the disease lasts in them once they do become infected as well. So um, here's a sort of graph I stole from one of Nick's recent papers. Thanks, Nick. That was a good illustration. Uh, you can, I'll, I'll bill you later, or you can bill me later. We'll get by your beer. Um, so what we can see here is these are the three different genotypes that occur in, in the common ones in white-tailed deer. So the 96GG is the uh, first to get infected, typically, most likely to get infected, and has the shortest course of disease, typically. Typically a couple years, uh, 18 months to, to 24 months. The uh, GS uh, genotype is less likely to get infected, uh, has a lower probability of infection, and the disease seems to last a bit longer. And I think, I'm not sure what, what, how much we know about the SS genotypes. They're pretty rare, but conceptually, we think that they probably are then even less susceptible to infection and have a longer period of which they, when they have disease as well. So one of the questions this raises is, are these animals just out there on the, in the environment and uh, contacting other animals and shedding infectious prions for a longer period of time? So are the, are the, are the uh, genotypes that are, seem to be more resistant? None of them are completely resistant. They all get infected and they all eventually die. But are some of them actually then shedding in, uh, infection, infectious material into the environment for a long period of time? Um, so this is a question I think we have very little information about and it's a pretty important question for what's gonna happen because everybody seems pretty strongly convinced that we're gonna have genotypic shifts in our populations due to CWD, that basically we're gonna find populations having more of these resistant type of genotypes. And so is that gonna be just a, a contribute to the epidemiology and spread of the disease or how's, what's gonna happen in the future? So we have a, a recent paper that we published where there was a suggestion, I guess the way I would say it, a suggestion in it that perhaps these more resistant genotypes aren't shedding quite as much as the more susceptible genotypes. Um, or quite as frequently. So I think this is another area where we learn, we need to learn a lot more about what's going on with the different genotypes and sort of what the future holds in that regard. So why is this route of transmission important? Why do we care that animals are either having direct contact with the disease and transmitting that way or through the environment? Well, first of all, um, we don't know what the environmental reservoirs are very well at this point, so it's pretty hard to do, know what to do about that if that's an important uh, avenue of transmission and how we might manage it. We still, as Ed pointed out, we still don't know much about the longevity of CWD prions in the environment. We know that things like, we know they're out there for at least a couple years, probably a lot longer than that. Scrapie has been documented to be in the environment um, for 60, up to 16 years. CWD may have some lifetime like that in the environment, which makes it, it's gonna be hard to, for us to deal with that if it's a major or an important source of, of transmission to um, uh, susceptible animals. So we have to sort of, if we're gonna think about controlling this disease or managing it, we have to think about, do we concentrate on deer or do we concentrate on the environment? Do we concentrate on both? And when are the right times to do that um, in terms of trying to find management strategies? So knowing how uh, the environmental sources work, um, I think are important to our long-term uh, management of this disease. And there's a paper, a good modeling paper by Emily Almberg that showed that if environmental transmission is going on, it's a lot harder to deal with it as, uh, in terms of control of the disease and infection rates.
So what are some of the, what do we know about what's what's been done so far? Um, not much, to be really honest with you. This is a really big question, and it's been very difficult to detect prions um, in the environment um, for many of the reasons that Ed talked about in terms of in, in inhibitory uh, uh, chemicals and other things that are in the environment and make it more challenging. But um, Tracy Nichols has found that in, in, a, in a water source in Colorado is, is um, one area where uh, it's been documented. That, and we have a paper now that's in review where we evaluated about a dozen mineral licks in southern Wisconsin where we have CWD. And the majority of them had prions in them, um, either in the water or the soil. So those may be hot spots where animals can transmit disease to other animals through the environment. And this is really, it's really challenging because, uh, and important, um, because prions tend to bind to soil particles, particularly clay particles. And so it's, number one, it's hard to extract them and find them in these, in these places. But number two is when they become in, in bound to these clay particles, they seem to become more infectious as well. So we need a sort of better understanding of how that works. That's sort of been shown in some of the prions, but we need a better understanding of how that might work for CWD in particular, and whether binding to soil, which animals then may consume, um, is actually a more, a more highly infectious source of, of the disease than just an uh, oral um, exposure. So another area where I think we have to have long-term concern in particular is prion uptake in plants. Um, that's been documented now in a couple of studies. Um, as I've noted here, one study in Canada um, found that um, it attached to the roots but didn't get up to the leaves in terms of chronic wasting disease. And then a, a, a little more recent study showed that actually can get into the leaves and stems of plants as well. And there are several people working on similar, similar results as well. So in the lab, conceptually, we can get uptake of prions into plants, which then could be consumed as food by Cervids, but also by other species, of course. It's another route for potential um, cross-species uh, problems. Um, and so far, nobody's been able to document that, that I know of anyway, has been able to document this in a field setting. You know, we, not, we, have, we have not yet been able to show that plants out in the real world are uptaking prions, which then would provide a potential source of transmission of disease. And so this is obviously some an area that I think we need a lot more investigation of and because it has a lot of importance for the future and for other species as well. So um, what do we know about the environment? Well, as I said, that uh, scrapie has been in fact, has been shown to be um, in the environment for uh, three years and even 16 years in uh, a sheep farm in Iceland. And we know that CWD can be uh, in, in the pen studies in Colorado um, that was done when CWD had, had um, been there for at least two years. So we know that um, those kind of things are important, but we don't know how long. So sort of to try to put this in a little, maybe a summary framework in a sense, this is my personal, only my personal, conceptual model of what might be going on um, during some of these uh, CWD outbreaks. So if the the brown line um, is direct transmission, brown for deer. Um, the red line is sort of total transmission, and the green line is my representation of what might be going on in the environment. So what I see in Wisconsin tells me that probably early on in an outbreak, most of the transmission that's going on is direct animal to animal contact by um, whatever means is going, but the social contact and those kind of things. And as time goes on, that is that temp that typically builds up when we get more and more transmission. But at some time into that cycle, we get enough deer that have been on the in, the in the environment and deposited infectious prions into the environment that the environmental route probably becomes more important. I don't know when that time is. And eventually, it may cross over with the direct transmission. It may become more important. Now, I don't know if it stays below or crosses over, but certainly crossing over is a possibility as well. And so in that, and what it does is just contributes to more and more um, in, in, to the rate of infection becomes greater as you have those two sources. And they may change over time. And so if we can figure out how they change over time, we can think about when we might want to manage. But obviously, if we enter this kind of a scenario, if we want to try to control the disease or manage it, we want to do so early before that environmental contamination becomes an important issue. Because once that's there, 
it's going to be there for quite a long time. We can maybe deal with the animal source of transmission a lot easier, despite the fact that that is very difficult. We can probably deal with that a lot easier than we can with the environmental route of transmission. So once we get to the point where the environmental route is important, um, it's going to be even more complicated. So what's the evidence that we have for, for environmental transmission? Um, OK, so um, we have the study that Miller did that shows that it's both direct and indirect. Our, our transmission are feasible in captive setting, where we have concentrated animals and concentrated contamination. Um, there is a study out of Colorado um, by uh, Dave Walter et al., where they looked at uh, correlations between inf CWD infection rates and clay content of the soil. And areas that had higher clay content had higher rates of CWD infection, which is what we would expect if uh, the prions are binding to clay and therefore becoming also more infectious to animals. However, we've also repeated those sort of analyses in Wisconsin at two different scales, trying to define change to see if there are soil conditions that might predict infection rates, and we can't find anything. So I think we're still of a mixed bag in terms of what we know about what's going on in the real world in terms of transmission. Um, and as I said also, that this, this study we, we have that's in the works now that looks at um, mineral X. So in contrast to that, what's the evidence for direct transmission? Well, this isn't very good either. Um, and I think you can imagine um, with deer, with their cryptic nature and their nighttime behaviors, but trying to understand what's happening with contact between deer and transmission of, a, of an agent like this is pretty challenging. But there are some sort of anecdotal things, I think, that are worth considering. So we found in Wisconsin, for example, that related females, if you're related to a female that's positive, you have a much higher probability of becoming infected than a, just an unrelated female that's sharing the same environment. So that's a signal that, you know, hey, maybe the social, social nature, this contact, which we know occurs between related females, may be an important factor in terms of direct transmission. We also know that, from, again, this is mostly studies from Wisconsin, the males seem to have about a three or four times uh, probability of becoming infected as females do. But if we look at how much of the environment they use, their home ranges are not three to four times that of females. There may be 1.3 to 1.5 times um, that of females. So, the environment doesn't really explain at, this, at that point why males have such a higher infection rate. And my suspicion is that a lot of that is social um, and potentially even so, uh, interaction with other, other males during the bachelor period. Another uh, sort of anecdotal piece of information is that we found that um, CWD transmission is frequency dependent. So without getting into the debate or, and the uh, complexity of frequency dependent and density dependence, Frequency dependence is the kind of thing we have in diseases that are sexually transmitted in humans, for example. So there's a social limit on, you don't, you don't randomly mix with everybody and spread disease. Like if you had influenza or a cold, that would be more of a density dependent model. But, but models that frequency dependent, you're, we have limited number of contacts, um, tend, to, tend to be more frequency dependent. So that sort of is another potential signal that what's going on is potentially transmitted by animals who are contacting and knowing each other um, as we have in sort of in dear social groups. One of the conundrums I have about a lot of this in terms of direct contract is that, uh, contact is fawns and young deer. So there isn't, a, there isn't a pair bond that's more highly interactive and highly social than a, than a mother and his fawn but yet we see much lower rates of infection in young deer than we see in older deer. We don't, we don't see the high infection rates that we might expect if does were transmitting to their fawns. So at, at least one, so there, there may be a number of reasons why that's occurring, but at least one of those must be at least an explanation that maybe there's an environmental route there for fawns. They just have much less exposure to the environment than, than other deer, than adult deer do. Okay, so another, another thing that uh, has been talked about is these methods that we have, the in vitro methods for detection of prions in the environment. So we now have very highly sensitive methods to detect prions. 
Um, they have their quirks, they have their finicky issues, um, but they're, they're called PMCA and RT Quick, which we've heard discussed before. Um, the challenges we have are extracting prions, some of the challenges we have are extracting prions from these complex matrices. There's a lot of inhibitory compounds in there. They may be bound to things like clay particles and those kind of things. So these are not easy um, to do, but I think we're making some progress in terms of developing improvements in them that help us extract prions, at least some of the prions that are in soil and potentially hopefully in plants as well. And I guess I want to express a concern to all you folks who are thinking about this issue of, of whether it's direct or indirect transmission. And that concern is that I think the techniques are taking us in a direction that are going to allow us to find environmental sources of prions. And so I think it's natural then to come to the conclusion that the environment is the major route of transmission. And I think that would be premature. And so let me sort of give you an example of, of of how we can maybe sometimes go down the wrong path or maybe a path that we should think about more. So it's been proposed fairly recently that we do control burns to um, control or manage chronic wasting disease. So there's a whole myriad of assumptions in that suggested strategy. But certainly one of the big assumptions is that the major route of transmission is environmental. If the major route of transmission is direct rather than uh, indirect, then burning is, shouldn't have any effect at all, probably, on transmission of disease or infection rates. Um, the other thing is that it assumes is that probably the, route, the sources of infection are just generally distributed across the landscape where we could burn fields or woods and then get rid of them rather than hot spots, for example, like feeding and baiting route areas or mineral licks or some places like that. So there's a lot of other assumptions, too, that are involved in that. But I think. Uh, we need to be careful about sort of coming to the conclusion that because we can detect these uh, prions in the environment that therefore that's the major route of, of which the uh, transmission is occurring. So I just wanted to sort of note a few of the management and research needs that I, I think are important here. So um, just trying to figure out how these direct and indirect transmission works um, during an epidemic I think is pretty important to try to give us a long-term handle on how, what's going to happen to our uh, populations in the long run and what kind of problems we're going to deal with in terms of trying to manage this disease and what kind of impacts it's going to have on the animals themselves. Um, this is not going to be easy. Um, we, for a number of years, tried to get um, pretty significant NSF funding to work on this and weren't very successful. Um, Colorado, I think, had some funds to do so and sort of, uh, I think, had issues as well. Um, in terms of trying to answer these questions. But I think we need to make progress on them so we can predict what the future looks like. Um, we need to understand better what those environmental reservoirs are. We, we, we really have some only preliminary insights and, and sort of hypotheses at this point. And so if we're going to have to deal with managing this disease in the environment, we'd be better off to try to figure out what those sources of infection are to other animals. Are they generally distributed by feces and urine? Are they in hot spots? Um, how are they, it's one thing to sort of say they're, they're deposited in the environment, but the real key is, okay, when are animals uptaking that, that contaminated material? Um, we, we need probably some more information about the, the rate of infectivity, the amount of infectious material that are in these different secretions that animals have, and how long they are secreting them as well. How much, basically, how much prions are they putting in the environment or potentially um, uh, using to contact with other animals as well. And then also, we need to figure out what's happening with the different genotypes, because that tells us more what the long-term picture is going to be in terms of shedding of, of these prions um, into the environment and other places. And um, really, we, we need uh, some improvements in these detection methods. They're very sensitive now. They're not always real practical, but I think they're becoming um, in the hands of folks at Colorado State. and and Texas and other places are becoming a lot more practical these days. I would still call them sort of in the research realm, um, maybe not quite to the management realm, but I think they're becoming closer, and so hopefully they can help us answer some questions um, about what's going on with this disease. So that's it, and I guess we're not doing questions till later. Okay, all right, thanks.